that's that's the plan. Okay, great. That sounds like a great overview, William. Thank you for joining us. And is this going to be a presentation that you'd mainly like to just go through? Do you want people to interrupt with questions, talk about them at the end? Um, yeah, what's what's your pr preference on that? Um, I would actually love it if you know people just interrupt me with questions uh, as they come up. Um, in fact, actually, also the best way is usually just by speaking because it's hard to read the chat when I'm presenting. Um, but you know, either way, um, you know, I'll pause a few times to ask for questions, and also at the end. So, um, yeah, I think we should be quite flexible with this. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for coming uh, to talk with us today, William. For people listening online, William is a PhD student doing lots of cool quantum computing and cryptographic stuff for Scott Aronson. And yeah, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Uh, cool. So um, to you know, really start motivating some of the things we're going to talk about, I'm first going to really need to just review uh, the, the very basics of classical cryptography. And uh, I imagine that this will be stuff that a lot of you have seen before, but uh, I think it'll be helpful to go through and kind of illustrate what some of the key issues are. Um, and I'm going to start with what's you know arguably the the simplest possible example um, in cryptography, which is, uh, you know, so, so in cryptography, you always have these two players, they're named Alice and Bob, uh -huh. uh, or sometimes you have more players, I guess, but, but usually you have at least Alice and Bob. Uh, and kind of the most simple example of a cryptographic task you can imagine is uh, where Alice wants to send uh, Bob some secret message that we'll call M. Uh, and we'll suppose that Alice and Bob have shared in advance uh, some secret key that we'll call S. Um, and um, the way we'll model this is we'll say that Alice has some encoding algorithm by which she can um, uh, encode her message with the secret key S, producing a ciphertext C. And Bob has some decoding algorithm by which he can recover the message M um, from the secret and, uh, and the ciphertext. And um, as for what security property we care about, um, I'm going to start by you know talking about what's arguably the the simplest possible notion of security that you could uh, uh, you could consider, and also perhaps the strongest possible, which is uh, what's sometimes known as basically perfect secrecy. Uh, and what perfect secrecy says is that um, uh, for any eavesdropper who listens in on the ciphertext and who does not know the secret key. Um, uh, essentially, the eavesdropper should gain exactly zero information by looking at the ciphertext. Uh, and the formula you would define this is by saying that, you know, in, in expectation over the secret key, um, that the probability that the, the ciphertext equals um, any of, you know, any two different messages, M1 and M2, uh, should be the same for, for all possible messages. Um, is that clear? Cool. So uh, this is sort of the, you know, as I said, the strongest possible notion of security that one could possibly hope for. Um, and in uh, what is arguably the very paper first founded the, the uh, modern notions of cryptography in the 1940s by Claude Shannon, uh, it was established that this notion of perfect secrecy actually requires Alice and Bob to share a secret key S uh, whose size is essentially the same uh, as the length of the message that they are trying to transmit. Um, so in other words, the, the number of bits in the secret key has to be essentially exactly equal to the number of bits in the message. Um, and, you know, if you see this, you should sort of be left wondering, like, you know, uh, you know, if, if this is, if we can prove unconditionally that you need a secret key that's as long as the message, and you need to basically share the secret key in advance, and how are we possibly, you know, securing in, uh, information on the internet and whatnot? Um, you know, how can you possibly send your your credit card number to Amazon without ever having, you know, met someone in a secret alley to share a secret key by which you could later send securely your credit card information? Um, and this kind of motivates, uh, rather than perfect secrecy, a a different notion of uh, of cryptographic security, which. Uh, you might call uh, practical uh, practical secrecy, which basically just means that for any uh, efficient eavesdropper, it should be computationally difficult for the eavesdropper to uh, decipher the message M given the ciphertext C. 
Um, and uh, yeah, you know, arguably this paper by, by Shannon in the 40s was kind of the first paper where this, uh, this notion of computational secrecy was actually uh, kind of uh, rigorously defined and taken seriously. Um, and I just want to kind of give you a brief overview of, you know, how uh, these kinds of computational um, uh, proofs of security tend to operate. Um, and the way I'm going to do that is by introducing you to what is, you know, arguably the, the single most basic primitive in, in all of cryptography, which is something known as a one-way function. Uh, and this is something that I'm sure many of you have heard of before. Um, intuitively, a one-way function is something that is easy to compute. Uh, so, so you can uh, compute it forward in one way, but it is hard to invert. Uh, and it is hard to invert in the sense that uh, for any efficient adversary A, if I choose a random input X to this function and I feed an F of X to A, uh, then A should not be able to find uh, an output Y such that F of Y is equal to F of X. So like, like the probability that A successfully inverts this function uh, and finds a pre-image that maps to the same output is negligible. Uh, and so why do we care about one-way functions? Well, uh, there's kind of three uh, key things to note about one-way functions, um, which is that first, uh, it has been essentially rigorously, rigorously established that uh, for essentially all interesting uh, cryptography that one could possibly hope for, uh, one-way functions turn out to actually be necessary. Um, so for you know, a, a variety of cryptographic protocols, uh, including symmetric key cryptography, um, key exchange, uh, uh, assuming that a, a secure such protocol exists, you actually conclude that uh, there must also exist a one-way function f. Uh, it also turns out that one-way functions are also sufficient for a wide range of, of cryptography, uh, including uh, things like symmetric key cryptography, uh, pseudorandom generators, commitments, uh, not things I'm going to actually define, but just you know, kind of giving you a flavor that uh, there's a, um, a wide variety of applications of one-way functions where you know, just from assuming that such a thing exists, you get a, a, a big range of, of useful cryptography. Um, but finally, you know, maybe the, the most important thing I want to emphasize about one-way functions is that uh, they do not exist if P is equal to NP. Uh, and another way of saying this is that, uh, you know, no one has actually unconditionally proven that one-way functions exist, right? Um, there's, you know, um, you know the, the P versus NP problem is probably the single most famous unsolved problem in all of computer science. It's one of the Millennium Prize problems. So. Uh, if you resolve this problem, you would win a million dollars. Um, and um, uh, yeah, the, the existence of one-way functions is actually even stronger than uh, the existence of a separation between P and NP. Uh, and so no one has actually rigorously proven that such a thing exists. Um, and this is kind of the, the, the main thing I wanted to get to in, in classical cryptography is that uh, generally speaking, we need these kinds of computational assumptions uh, that are not yet proven in order to, to get interesting cryptography. Um, we haven't, we can't really prove things are unconditionally computationally secure. Uh, does that make sense? To be clear though, you still have one time pad regardless of P versus Yeah, yeah, P, right? the, the, the yeah. one time pad is unconditionally secure, but again, you have to, right. you have to sh share the secret key in advance. Um, but if and, you want like even the remotest yeah. amount of compression, yeah. If then you you need it. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. P pretty much. Yeah. Right. The, the computational secrecy, right? Rather than the uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because because once you have um, once your your key length is shorter than the message, then there's always going to be some information theoretic attack uh, on your on your protocol. It, it's just not necessarily efficient. Yeah. Right. And that's the world we live in right now. Everywhere Amazon on these things, they just sort of are saying, "Well, we hope PNNP." are different and one-way functions exist and there aren't good attacks on AES or whatever system you're using. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. Uh, cool, so that's basically uh, most of what I wanted to say about uh, classical cryptography. And um, so, you know, to kind of give you a flavor of what's going to change going ahead, uh, what will happen is uh, quantum information will turn out to behave very differently from classical information. Uh, and as a result, it'll actually 
uh, turn out that for, for certain protocols, we can actually achieve things uh, using quantum states where um, one of two things can happen. Either we can achieve something that's just you know, provably impossible classically. So there are things we can do quantumly that we just can't do classically. Or another thing that can happen is that we can do things quantumly where we can prove its uh, security unconditionally, whereas classically we rely on these sorts of computational assumptions. Uh, and that's going to be the kinds of things uh, that I'm going to try to, to show you some examples of in this talk. Um, but in order to get to that, I'm going to have to first give you kind of a, a brief introduction to quantum information. Um, and in quantum information, unlike in classical information, so, so in classical information, sort of the, the basic unit of information is the bit, a zero or one. Uh, and in quantum information, the, the basic unit of information is a qubit. Uh, so what is a qubit? Uh, well, informally, a qubit, all it is, is it is a two-dimensional vector with complex entries whose norm, so uh, who, whose, um, well, yeah, whose norm or its length is one. So the, the the sum of the squared absolute values of the entries should be equal to one. So it's just some column vector alpha beta. Um, and we tend to borrow this notation a lot from physics actually, which is to write uh, these vectors as what we call a ket. So, so this is a ket, that just means it's a, a column vector. Um, has, has anyone actually seen this notation before? I'm curious. Yeah, okay, so, so, so maybe this is gonna be a view for a lot of you. Um, and um, to see how this kind of generalizes uh, classical information, we usually define two kind of uh, canonical quantum states, which are the, the ket zero or just zero and one states. Uh, so zero is just the vector one zero and one is just the vector zero one. Um, and you know, if we use this ket notation that we have up here, another way of saying this is that you can just write psi uh, as a linear combination of the zero and one vectors, right? So in this case, um, you know, another way of writing psi instead of as this, this column vector, we just write it as alpha ket zero plus beta ket one. Um, another important piece of notation is uh, what is sometimes called a bra. So uh, this is, you take a ket and you write it backwards. Uh, and all that denotes is that you take uh, a column vector and you turn it into its conjugate transpose. So uh, it, instead of being a column vector, this is now a, a row vector where I have complex conjugated every entry. Uh, and again, you can also just expand this out using um, uh, the, the bracket not notation as you know alpha bra zero plus, uh, or sorry, alpha conjugate bra zero plus beta conjugate bra one. Um, and uh, what makes this notation co uh, convenient is that if you if you put a bra and a ket together, you get the bracket, as it is called, um, which actually just denotes the inner product of two different quantum states or two different vectors, because you just uh, you know you're writing it as the product of a a, a row vector and a column vector, uh, which is just the same as as taking the inner product, uh, you know the the complex inner product where you conjugate one of the vectors. Um, um, and, and yeah, and otherwise you just take the sum of these these uh, pairwise multiplications. Make sense? We've discussed, Jacob and I have discussed how this is like one of the most beautiful examples of domain specific programming language design in history. Oh yeah, and interesting. Precedes PL, but like, you know, the, the hot new thing in PL is you design languages that are for domain experts in that field so that mm -hmm. it matches their intuition. And this is basically that, right? It's like a phenomenally good syntax for the calculus mm -hmm. of dealing mm -hmm. with uh, uh, the math of quantum stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Math, I, was, I was thinking about a similar thing just now, like Dirac or whoever made this notation. It's like, yeah, it's cool to put such a visual emphasis on, and you're going to want to inner product things a bunch. Otherwise, your comp computations are going to become horrible. So. Right, yeah, like w w when you work with this notation enough, you kind of get to a point where even just, you know, working on things in linear algebra that have nothing to do with quantum states, you'll find it more convenient. Just to use this notation, it's kind of fun. Yeah. Cool, so uh, so what can you do with quantum states? Well, uh, arguably the, the most important thing you can do with a quantum state is you can measure it. Uh, and measuring a quantum state 
uh, is always done with respect to an orthonormal basis. So for, for two qubits, or, uh, or sorry, for one qubit, an orthonormal basis is always just um, uh, basically a pair of two quantum states that are orthogonal. Um, and when you measure on a basis, what happens is the quantum state um, will uh, collapse onto one of the two states uh, via something that is called uh, sometimes the Born rule, um, where uh, the probability it collapses on, onto one of these vectors, let's say vi, uh, is, that, is exactly the squared inner product between psi and that vector. Um, so to give an example, if you take your state psi uh, and you measure it in the zero one basis, um, you will see either you know zero with some probability or one with some probability, uh, and the probability of seeing zero or uh, or one is exactly just uh, the um, well in this case alpha uh, the absolute value of alpha squared or the absolute value of beta squared. Um, I realized one thing I forgot to mention, which is not really that important, but these things alpha and beta are sometimes called amplitudes, uh, and these amplitudes are basically. Uh, that you know they, they sort of play the role of like square roots of probabilities, right? Because you know that you uh, when you take a state and you measure on the computational basis, the probability of seeing uh, any particular basis vector um, is is exactly proportional to the square of these. Um, and you know, believe it or not, uh, we already have enough uh, tools to see one of the kind of striking. Um, uh, well, yeah, I guess you could say one of the striking phenomena that appears in quantum information that doesn't really have uh, any meaningful classical analog, as far as I know. Uh, and that is actually the uncertainty principle. Um, you might have heard of the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle before, which is sort of uh, uh, a, a special case of, of this kind of more general uncertainty principle. Uh, and the uncertainty principle basically just observes that um, the more that your quantum state psi is determined, uh, its measurement outcomes are determined in one basis, actually the less determined it will be in a different basis. So uh, I'm actually gonna, gonna try to give you an example of this to illustrate what I mean. Uh, and this example is gonna involve um, four states. So you know, first it's gonna involve the, the, the zero and one states that I, that I had before, which as before are just you know, the two uh, kind of standard basis vectors, the X and Y coordinates. Um, but we're also going to have these two uh, vectors that are rotated by 45 degrees, uh, which we'll sometimes call the, the, the plus and minus states, um, which are just uh, kind of, you know, well, they're, they're linear combinations of zero and one, you know, where you either take zero plus one or zero minus one uh, with this, you know, divided by root two factor to, to normalize it to be uh, a, a unit length quantum state. So let's say we look at uh, psi being the, the zero state. Um, so as before, we established that if you measure the state in the zero one basis, you will basically always see the zero state. You'll always see the zero outcome. So in other words, uh, measuring psi in the zero uh, in the zero one basis uh, always produces a completely determined outcome. Right? You'll see zero with probability one. But if you measure psi in the plus minus basis, uh, you will actually see a completely undetermined outcome where uh, the probability of measuring plus or minus will actually be exactly one half in, uh, for, for both plus and minus. Um, and this is just you know, via simple computation. Uh, again, we recall that this, um, this corresponds to just the inner product of these two vectors. So the inner product is uh, of two vectors that are 45 degrees away from each other is exactly uh, one over root two. And then when we square that, we get one half. Uh, and this is true for both the plus and the minus vectors with respect to zero. Okay. Uh, but now let's say we, we switch and instead of looking at psi equals zero, we look at psi equals plus. Uh, what happens is that this exactly switches. So whereas previously the zero state was completely determined in the zero one basis and was completely undetermined in the plus minus basis, conversely, the plus state is completely undetermined in the zero one basis but completely determined in the plus minus basis. So, well, again, just to, to restate what's at the top of the slide, the more that some state is determined in one basis, the less it can be determined in a different basis. And as I said, this is called the uncertainty principle. Um, you know, that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle refers to a particular kind of uncertainty where uh, one basis is the, 
I guess the momentum basis and the other is the, uh, what is it, the position basis? Yeah, but uh, that, that won't be too important for us. Cool, any questions about this? Um, I do have one question, which might be a bit out of scope, so feel free to punt. But yeah, so if we look at the classical analog on this graph over here, mm -hmm. um, we don't have anything that's between, like if we're thinking of bits, we don't have anything that's really between zero or one. We can think, yeah. of, we don't know what it is and we wanna measure and know what it, what it was before. But in quantum, it's like, no, it's literally in the middle. Measurement does an operation to it and puts it along some, some basis for us. Because right. My, my question here is all the cool stuff you can do with quantum information, is there anything else that it comes from or is it simply this abstraction of this measurement being able to be somewhere on the block sphere rather than in a zero or one? Is there like anything else we need? So this is uh, actually kind of a subtle point because um, it turns out that there's sort of a lot of features that we need of quantum mechanics in order for it to be useful. Um, another one is entanglement, um, which is something, you know, I will also talk about, um, but, uh, yeah. And, and like, also another thing, which I actually not really going to talk much about, but that is, you know, arguably even more important for, for kind of, uh, a lot of quantum algorithmic speedups is really interference. Um, basically the, the idea that, uh, you can have two, you know, two paths that interfere destructively, um, which doesn't really have, have much of a classical analog. Um, okay, you know, you know the, the, the wave nature of, of quantum information. That's great. So, so that's an awesome answer. So you're saying this is one of essentially, I'm sure there might be other. New yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of many, many properties that distinguishes and is also kind of key for, for a right. lot of these. I'd say the three big ones, you're teaching us one right here, entanglements another, and then interference is a third that we won't get into, but it's essentially, yeah, there are only a few like key concepts before you can start trying to. Uh, I, I would say morally speaking, there, okay. there, there might be others, but okay, cool. Morally speaking, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's great. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so far I've only talked about one qubit, um, but you know you might be wondering, well, how do you define the state of a system of multiple qubits? Uh, and the way that's normally defined is is using the tensor product. Um, so in this case, if I have a quantum state alpha beta and a different one gamma delta, uh, I can describe their joint state as a, a vector in four dimensional space by taking their Kronecker product, uh, which is just you know, this expression that you might've seen before. Um, in general, if I have a system of n qubits, I can describe its state as a, a unit vector in two to the n dimensions. Um, yeah, because basically every time you, you tack on one more qubit, the, the number of entries gets multiplied by two. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that's important to emphasize is that, you know, not every two qubit state can actually be expressed in this form. Um, you know, not, not, not every two qubit state is a tensor product. Um, and uh, such states that cannot be expressed as such a tensor product are called entangled states. Um, and so to give an example of one entangled state, uh, you know, you can write it this way as uh, basically a, a superposition of uh, the first qubit being zero, second qubit being zero, and first qubit being one, second qubit being one, uh, or vector. Uh, actually, does anyone see a short proof that you cannot express this vector as a, as a product of this form? Keep you on your toes. I mean, isn't it just because square root of two isn't rational? No, it's not because of that. Okay. The, the, these can be arbitrarily arbitrary complex numbers. I guess maybe it's a little subtle. So, so, so this entry, so, so alpha times mm -hmm. delta has to be zero, right? So, so one of these has to be zero, and also right. one of beta and gamma has to be zero. But also, both beta and delta need to be non-zero because they multiply to this, which is non-zero. Uh, and likewise for alpha and gamma. Uh, and that, that basically gives you a contradiction because you get that like all these things need to be non-zero, but they also need to be zero. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, cool. And okay, there was one other useful property of quantum information that I wanted to mention, um, which is uh, something that is known as the no cloning principle. 
which just says that uh, there is no physical procedure uh, that takes one copy of some state psi uh, and maps it to two copies of that same state. Um, where again, you know, two copies, that just means I have you know, alpha beta times alpha beta, which is this column vector. Uh, and it turns out that there's actually an extremely simple explanation for why this is the case. Um, the reason is that uh, it turns out that all physical operations that you can apply to a quantum state are linear operations. Uh, but this, uh, this cloning operation is a nonlinear operation, right? Because this alpha uh, appears here with an alpha squared, right? This is, this is some quadratic operation. So this is just not physically allowed. Does this make some sense? Um, um, yes, it does. And can I add in one, one note for the classically minded folks here about this? That's okay. Mm -hmm. Or were you going to say something more? Uh, no, it's a good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is something that took me a while to understand at first because I'm like, oh, if you have a specific state set to a certain value that we know, like for example, it's not entangled, let's say it's the ket one state, you can still construct another state. This isn't talking about um, making more states that you know of. You could have some factory that creates a whole bunch of identical states. Right, right. Like, like if psi is known, that certainly right. you could. Yeah, you but, but if it's unknown, unknown. yes. Yeah. Exactly. So that was yeah. the thing that always tripped me up. Yeah, and actually, you know, to give you a, a hint of what might be coming next, can anyone see any applications where this might be useful? Uh, where, where, where would it be helpful to have something where it is physically impossible to create a copy of it? Yeah, if I'm sending some information that I don't want people to uh, make a copy of, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, I, I just want to see what, what, what people think of. If you have to do a PhD and come up with something cool, related to quantum information. Well, so, so you think like copyright? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> I just, uh, I was mainly a joke that you're going to discover something cool from it. Uh, yeah, I was oh, okay. encryption like Max as well. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, so uh, then if you haven't seen this before, which it sounds like hopefully some people haven't, then this might be pretty surprising. So, um, uh, in fact, we've, we've basically already seen enough to do uh, what's um, one of kind of the most, uh, in my view, striking applications of uh, quantum information that was actually discovered uh, incredibly early in the history of quantum information, which is something I'm going to talk a bit uh, about more um, uh, after I kind of uh, tell you a bit more about this. Uh, and that is something known as quantum money. Um, and so what is the idea? Uh, the basic idea is it is a... A, a banknote where the, the banknote contains quantum information uh, with the property that it is impossible to clone that banknote uh, to, to, you know, to, to, to make counterfeit copies of the money. Um, and this is something that was uh, discovered by this guy uh, named Steven Wiesner actually in, in the 1960s. Um, here's a picture of him from I think the 70s or 80s and also a more recent picture of him. And um, What's arguably at least as interesting uh, as you know the, the existence of quantum money itself is kind of the, the story of its discovery because it was uh, it, it's kind of difficult to you know uh, to, just uh, illustrate just how far ahead of this its time it was. So um, quantum information as a field did not exist in the 1960s. Um, in fact, you know arguably this was like the very first. Uh, application of quantum information that anyone ever discovered. Uh, and you know, when it was discovered, it, it was not really you know, uh, explained using the kinds of notation that I've showed you so far, um, using like zeros and ones. And uh, indeed, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's uh, I, I believe that Stephen Wiesner originally tried to submit this paper to um, IEEE transactions on information theory in, in like the 60s or 70s, and it was rejected. Uh, because they said, this isn't about information theory, what are you doing? Um, and it wasn't until uh, over a decade later in the, the late 70s or early 80s where uh, finally this, this idea of quantum money was uh, published in basically a, a news column for some you know, computer science journal. Um, and um, 
it, it, it turned out to basically be one of the foundational papers in, in quantum information. So um, yeah, it, it, interesting story. By the way, Stephen Wiesner was also a pretty odd fellow as I understand it. So uh, in his later life, he actually um, more or less left academia. Uh, he, he converted to you know, Orthodox Judaism and uh, lived most of the rest of his life working as a, a manual construction laborer. Um, although he would still sometimes go to, to you know, some, some physics seminars, I believe. Um, so, so he didn't like, you know, completely leave academia, but yeah, that was, um, so sometimes I think to, you know, to, to, to have an idea that's, you know, this, this brilliant and ahead of its time, you have to be, you know, <laughs> uh, a bit different, I guess. Uh, okay, so, so, so how does this work? Um, well, remarkably, it's actually not that difficult to explain. So um, we're gonna have a bank who issues these banknotes. Uh, and the way that, that the bank is going to issue these banknotes, so, so every banknote is going to consist of two parts. First, it's gonna have a serial number S, which is just some classical information, right? It's just some string of zeros and ones. Uh, and then in addition, there's gonna be a quantum part of, of uh, of the banknote. And it turns out that this quantum part of the banknote is actually just going to involve uh, uh, random states uh, of the form either 0, 1, or, or plus minus. So, so these, these states that we've seen before, for each qubit, you're just going to you know, pick one of these four states uniformly at random. Uh, and you're going to just repeat this like n times, where, where n is something reasonably large. Um, and every time the bank issues a banknote, they're going to, to make a record of uh, you know, the serial number and of the state that they supposedly prepared uh, when they issued that banknote. Okay, so what can you do with this? Um, well, uh, in order to uh, basically verify the authenticity of this banknote, um, Alice will have to uh, actually physically bring this banknote back to the bank and in order to uh, check the banknote, here's what the bank will do. So first they will you know, look up the serial number in this giant table that they kept. Uh, and then for each one of these qubits, they are going to independently measure that qubit in the basis that it was prepared in. So if, uh, what does that mean? If the state is a plus or a minus, the bank will measure that state in the plus minus basis. If it was supposed to be a zero or a one, they will measure that state in the zero one basis. And in order to verify, they will do all these measurements and they will check that, um, uh, what is it? Yeah, they will check that the measurement outcomes agree with what they should be, right? So, you know, if you originally prepared a plus, when you measure in the plus minus basis, you should always see a plus. And similarly, when you, you know, prepared a zero, you measure in the zero one basis, you should always see a zero. Good. It turns out uh, that's basically the entire protocol. Um, and you can already maybe start to see some intuition for wh why this should work, right? So, um, you know, on the one hand, we know by the no cloning principle that there's no general way that Alice can take an unknown quantum state and turn it into two copies of that same quantum state. And, and of course, this is kind of the security property we want, right? The, the security property we, we want is that it should not be possible for Alice to take one of these bills and turn it into two counterfeit bills. Um, so, okay, you know, maybe there's no way that Alice could do this perfectly, right? But, but there, you know, there might be some ways that she could try to cheat, let's say, right? So, you know, what, what, what could she do, right? You know, she could, let's say, measure every qubit in a zero one basis, right? Um, so what will happen? So, you know, if the qubit was originally prepared as a zero or one, as these qubits were, she will learn what those were. But by the uncertainty principle, if the qubits were originally prepared in the plus or minus state, uh, Alice is gonna actually learn absolutely nothing. And in fact, not only that, is she going to learn nothing, she's also going to basically destroy the state in the process of doing this measurement. So uh, that doesn't really seem to work. Um, but, you know, okay, still, you might be left wondering, well, how can we actually vigorously prove that uh, this protocol is secure? And uh, in fact, it was actually uh, not until almost uh, three decades later 
uh, after it was published in the 70s or 80s, where it was finally uh, proved vigorously that uh, actually any counterfeiter will pass verification on like, so, so if they try to submit uh, two banknotes given only one, then they will pass verification with probability at most uh, roughly three fourths to the power of n. Uh, so uh, again, here n is just the number of qubits in the, in the banknote state. So if you choose n to be something sufficiently large, like, I don't know, 100, then this is gonna be some tiny probability. Um, And uh, yeah, I guess the main thing I really want to emphasize is that, you know, unlike in the classical setting, this is not a uh, this is not a computational proof, right? We are not assuming anything about the efficiency of the counterfeiting, right? This is fundamentally an information theoretic proof that is merely using uh, the postulates of quantum mechanics to establish that no counterfeiter can cheat at this task with good uh, with good probability. William, I realize that this is not the point, but out of curiosity, like how big of an apparatus do you need to stably store a qubit? For oh, no, that was going to be my next point. That was yeah. going to be my next point, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> which is that, you know, this is, this is wonderful, you know, in theory, um, but in practice, right, you know, uh, usually we're lucky if we can store, you know, a qubit for a few nanoseconds, you know, maybe if you have a giant, you know, a refrigerator that's storing them at a few millikelvins, you'll be lucky to store it for a few hours. So, you know, realistically, you know, having these quantum banknotes that you store in your quantum wallet is not something that's, you know, physically uh, easy to implement using current technology. And, you know, indeed probably needs uh, <laughs> so, some pretty significant advances to, to ever be feasible. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's the downside with, with Wiesner's quantum ID scheme. Cool, any other questions about this? Cool. Um, so yeah, again, I just want to emphasize, you know, this is an unconditional proof, does not require P not equal to NP or any of those sorts of computational assumptions. Okay, uh, a second, uh, also rather remarkable uh, application of uh, quantum information in cryptography that I'm gonna talk about uh, in hopefully a little, a little bit less time um, is something known as quantum key distribution, um, which was uh, developed by Bennett and Brassard in 1984 and was actually kind of uh, almost, well, in some ways kind of directly inspired by uh, Wiesner's quantum money scheme. And uh, this is a protocol by which two parties, Alice and Bob, can agree to a secret key um, in such a way that uh, that secret key cannot be learned by any third party. Um, and of course, you know, as we sort of established at, at the beginning, this is useful for cryptography because then um, once they've exchanged the secret key, uh, they can then do one-time paths to, to share messages securely uh, over, an, over an unsecured channel. Um, and to tell you a little bit more about the, the setup of this uh, protocol, so uh, there's basically two parts to this protocol. Um, so first, Alice and Bob, um, they share uh, a, an authenticated public classical channel. So what does that mean? So it is authenticated, meaning that um, if one of them receives a message, they know that it was sent by the other person. It is public, so anyone can read this channel, any adversary. Can, can look at this channel if they want. Uh, and it is classical, so it only involves zeros and ones, classical information. Uh, and then they also share an insecure quantum channel. Uh, and what this means is that, um, so, so they can send qubits, but these qubits can be read and manipulated and deleted or you know, uh, basically arbitrarily corrupted by any possible eavesdropper. And, um, the security guarantee that we're going to want, uh, any eavesdropper will learn the secret key with at most negligible probability. Um, and it turns out that you can do this. Um, and what's, well, yeah, unfortunately, I don't really have time to explain the details of how this protocol works. Although it turns out that um, it, it might not surprise you that the, the quantum states that are involved in this protocol are, are exactly the same set of four quantum states that we saw before. Um, and indeed, the quantum communication between Alice and Bob is basically just 
you, you randomly send pluses and minuses, zeros and ones. Um, they do some measurements and they kind of, you know, verify that they agree on those measurements. Um, and that kind of turns out to be the, the security proof. Um, interestingly, this is another case where, you know, it, it took a couple of decades to, for people to actually rigorously prove that this thing was secure. Um, but once again, this is another case where uh, this, this proof of security is actually information theoretic. Uh, it does not rely on any unproven computational assumptions. Um, there's just like an actual complete proof that, you know, it is physically impossible for, for any eavesdropper to, um, to, to, to learn the secret key that they, they, they are able to share. Um, now, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention about this is that um, actually unlike the, um, unlike the quantum money protocol, it turns out that you can actually even implement this protocol without using quantum memory. Um, and as a result, this, this protocol has actually been implemented in practice. Uh, and in fact, it has actually even been implemented uh, basically between a satellite and a ground station. Um, so uh, uh, this actually is something that people can do, which is, which is kind of remarkable. Um, it's, it, this does not require like um, a scalable quantum computer or, or quantum memory or anything like that. Just um, in, in principle, it can be done using pretty simple linear optical circuits. Um, so that's, that's pretty nice. Um, okay, so, so far we've seen a few examples where using quantum information, we can, uh, you know, achieve new protocols that are sort of impossible classically, or where if you want something similar classically, uh, you require something with, you know, some amount of computational assumptions. Um, Unfortunately, uh, quantum information is not sort of a cure-all for you know, replacing all of our computational assumptions um, by these information theoretic protocols. Um, it turns out that there are actually a, a variety of, um, of cryptographic uh, uh, tasks and protocols where uh, even to implement them, if you allow quantum information would still require computational assumptions. Um, so to give a few examples, uh, one thing I didn't really have that much time to talk about uh, is uh, what's known as publicly verifiable quantum money. So uh, in, the, in the quantum money scheme I told you about, um, in order to verify the banknote, Alice had to basically uh, bring the banknote to the bank and have them perform the verification, right? She could not verify herself whether the bill was authentic or not. Um, but public, publicly verifiable quantum money is of course, you know, where, where, where she can do that. Um, but unfortunately that requires computational assumptions. Um, another thing that's uh, kind of interesting, which I didn't really have much time to talk about either, uh, is what's known as quantum copy protected software, uh, which is essentially exactly what it sounds like. It is software that is sent via quantum information where you can you know, run the program once, but it is impossible to uh, create a copy of that. And in general, implementing this also requires computational assumptions. Uh, and finally, you know, a variety of, of tasks from, from classical cryptography also require computational assumptions, uh, things like symmetric key encryption, commitment schemes, et cetera. Um, and so this will finally bring me to uh, um, uh, Briefly talking about what I have I have done some research on, and uh, which is kind of basically the goal is to relax uh, what these computational assumptions are that we need in the quantum setting compared to the classical setting. So what do I mean by this? Um, so in this very recent paper that's actually uh, not out yet, but that should be out on the internet in hopefully a few weeks, um, my co-authors and I. Uh, show that there exists a, a property of a, a cryptographic hash function f that has the following uh, desirable features. Um, first, it is useful for quantum cryptography. So you could use it to implement you know, a variety of, of things like um, you know, some of these things I mentioned on the previous slide, like commitments and signatures. Um, it doesn't let you do all of the things I mentioned on the previous slide. So as far as we know, I don't think this lets you do like quantum money or copy protection software or anything like that. Um, second, 
uh, it turns out that this holds for uh, a, a quote unquote random function. Uh, and intuitively, all this means is that uh, we should sort of expect these function, uh, this property to hold for kind of uh, existing cryptographic hash functions like, you know, SHA-3, um, uh, what, what's another hash function, MD5, I don't know. You know, these sort of off the shelf cryptographic hash functions plausibly, you know, if they look random enough, they should have this property. And then finally, what's maybe the most interesting thing is that we show that um, in, in some restricted setting, in, in the so-called black box setting, uh, the, exi the existence of this property is actually independent of the P versus NP problem, right? So whereas previously, in order to get any interesting cryptography classically, we basically needed to assume only functions exist. And therefore, we needed to assume that P is not equal to NP. Here, we're sort of giving some evidence that in the quantum setting, even for these protocols that require computational assumptions, um, by allowing quantum information, you can perhaps get by with some weaker computational assumptions uh, that are sort of independent of the P versus NP problem. Um, you know, that being said, there's still unproven assumptions. Uh, I, would, I would guess that they you know, probably are still not provable using current techniques, but you know, they're not directly related to P versus NP. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the key message of this work. Are there any questions about this? So I do have many questions. I think that's super interesting, but let me ask um, a silly one at first, just to rephrase, to make sure I'm getting the gist of this properly. So we assume we have one-way functions in classical computation, which has its problems because that's not proven. Yeah. However, you're saying that if someone built a quantum computer with a, a logical logical qubits, ones that you can rely on essentially, mm -hmm. that you would be able to say, hey, you take your function that passes some threshold of being good enough, like a hash function that seems random, and you can do some modifications to it that remove the requirement or, or remove the requirement for one-way functions to exist? Or am I saying that incorrectly? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much correct. Or it's basically saying that the, the security property you need of F is no longer that it's a one-way function. It's something weaker. It's something formally weaker. Yeah. Awesome. And what, is, what does useful mean in question one? Uh, just useful in the sense that assuming that such a thing exists, it suffices to instantiate these these protocols. Okay. Um, you know, I, I didn't go into too much detail about exactly what kinds of protocols, but you know, things that that require computational assumptions. Um, right. So, like for example, a signature would require that you need to be able to trust a hash function, and this could this could drop in for something like that. Or... Um. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'll, I, have, I have other questions, but I'll uh, let other people ask some too. Thank you for these explanations. That's really cool, by the way. William, does this have any implications for the P versus NP question? Or does it just have meta implications for why we are not so enamored with that question? Because like, regardless, we're sort of okay. Uh, I think, it, yeah, I think it's more the latter. It's just saying, you know, that there's some hope that like, you know, even if the cryptographer's nightmare P equals MP is true, that you could still get useful quantum cryptography. Um, I mean, it, it, it's kind of weaker than that though, because again, this, this, third, um, this third point is, you know, it's independent of P versus NP in this kind of restricted model. So, you know, I haven't, I'm not gonna really have much time to talk about this, but it's something called the black box model. Um, we like the black box model because in practice, it turns out that a lot of the techniques that we know how to use are so-called black box reductions or, or black box proofs. And so if we can, can show things um, hold, do not hold in the black box model that you know, gives um, you know, may, maybe some evidence that at least you know, the, the, the most naive things you might try um, uh, would or, or would not work. Yeah. So, um, but, but yeah, it's basically saying, you know, it, it, you could instantiate security, hopefully, even if people's empty. Yeah. 
That's super awesome. Okay, so other people, please feel free to jump in if you have questions. Uh, if not, I'll keep going a bit. Yeah, I have a question. Oh yeah, go for it. Um, it seems to me like the main problem in computer security is human error and like mm -hmm. social dynamics. And we have all these sophisticated math um, to like prove stuff is uncrackable, but like, you know, yeah. wasn't no, Stuxnet, you, you, didn't Stuxnet happen because people like just randomly plugged in USB drives into their computers. Yeah, yeah, you're hundred percent right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what are your I thoughts mean, on that? Yeah, I think I think a, a lot of cryptography in practice is, you know, the theory is great, but it turns out that like implementing the theory is is really hard. Uh, a lot of times, you know, there's all kinds of attacks that, you know, kind of don't even occur to you in the theoretical model because the theoretical model turns out to just not really represent. What happens in the real world right you know there can be these these really subtle attacks where like you um you know you, you basically time how long it takes the computer to compute something right like you know up to up to milliseconds and that can like tell you some information about the secret key you know right like you, you just leak information in ways you don't expect so so yeah that's you know certainly not not at all addressed but by by this work Awesome, that's a great question. So I've got another one, Anthony, David, uh, please feel free to jump in if you'd like. So when I was studying um, a lot more quantum than I am now in 2019 and did a write up on Ewing Tank's paper with your current advisor, um, one of the things I was really curious about as more of a computer science person was like, all right, so if we had quantum computers, what things could we just tractably do that would be different? And how would it be different programming here? And at that time, the, the best thing I could come up with is that, oh man, when is quantum computing better? It seems like any time there's a problem of periodicity, uh -huh. uh, yep. we need to use Fourier transform. That's something that's better and mm -hmm. ends up being used in these convoluted ways and like Shor's algorithm to break the factoring problem and all these things. Is that still, um, the primary technique used in situations like this where you're showing um, we can get something provably better under some criteria with quantum than classical? Or are there other types of general techniques or or like key tricks or concepts that are- Oh, um, it's a good question. So, um, It's actually a, a really good question. <laughs> it's actually difficult to answer. Um, so there are some quantum algorithmic speedups that do not involve the Fourier transform. Um, but as far as I know, for like the speedups for real world problems that we care about, the ones that don't involve like Fourier transforms in some way usually are not very large. Um, so oftentimes quantum algorithms can get a quadratic speed up for certain problems by something known as Grover's algorithm. Um, Grover's algorithm lets you search a database of n, n items using only square root of n queries, basically. Um, and it doesn't really use, uh, I, in my view, it doesn't really use Fourier transform that much, uh, or it does not necess necessitate it. Awesome. Um, but, like I think a lot of people also doubt that actually any quadratic speedups are ever going to be big enough to be uh, um, of any use because all of the overhead in, in implementing a quantum computer is just so big uh, that we really need these like larger exponential speedups in order to to get separations. Um, I think the main place where a lot of people have hope is in like physical simulation and quantum chemistry where, you know, if you can just simulate physical systems, um, you know, estimate properties of the dynamics um, that um, does not directly involve, you know, sure algorithm -like techniques and also is very possibly, you know, could answer questions that we don't know how to answer today. But, you know, I think even then it's still kind of in the air um, how useful any of that will ever be. Um, 
Awesome. That's a great answer. Um, I have one follow up and then I'll I'll give you one hard question and one easy question. You can choose if you want to answer both or just one of them. Um, the hard one, I think, follows on with this, right? Where it's like, do you think that the um, Fourier transform in periodicity is so prolific because that is the best thing quantum computers can do over classical ones for some computational or theory of computation reason? Or is it just a lack of knowledge so far? I'm curious about your intuition on that. And my other question is, I think this is a fascinating field and I'm curious what parts you are constantly curious about or, or why you like it or pick this one. So. Oh, sure. So, okay, to answer the first question, uh, my intuition is absolutely that there are quantum algorithms that have not been discovered. Um, I mean, and the reason for this intuition is just that if you look at classical algorithm design, um, you know, so much of, of the classical algorithms that we have today were only developed after we actually had physical computers and could try stuff, right? Um, and I think there's, you know, a lot of reason to be optimistic that once we actually have hardware, there could be, you know, discoveries of things that just work well in practice or, you know, we'll have new ways of thinking about things that didn't occur to us, or we'll just have more people thinking about these questions and, you know, more eyes looking at these than we do today. So, so yeah, I, I tend to believe quantum Fourier transform is not the only, only speed up, but I'm also just optimistic that way. Um, as for what I find compelling about the field, um, I think what really excited me about it is that it's a pretty young field. Uh, it's very easy to get into uh, research wise, like, um, you know, for a lot of these questions, you really need very little more knowledge than just basic linear algebra. And, um, I, I enjoy that a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah, they're just, it's, it's, it's easier to get started thinking about a lot of the, the, the research frontier questions. Um, are there, yeah, are there and also it's just, sorry. I'm sorry, you can finish your thought in the last. No, 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 I, I didn't really have. Okay, are, are there classes of like, I don't know the right term, but like classes of computation or of like of comp, uh, computer power, I guess, where we know that, that that class would be better and more powerful than a quantum computer, but we don't know. Okay, one, we know it's better than quantum. Two, we don't know how to physically realize it. But three, you have the intuition that it might be physically realizable. Like, um, oh, uh, <laughs> that's another very good question. That's actually something my advisor has done a lot of research about. Um, like, so, so in, in, in quantum computation, you know, the, the normal class that, that corresponds to the set of efficiently computable problems is BQB. You might have heard of this before. Um, so, like, is there something beyond BQP that is plausibly physically realizable? Um, so uh, I think up until very recently, there was like very little evidence that uh, there was anything that could, that was physical, that could not be simulated in BQP. But recently there has been some evidence that like some questions involving black holes um, might not be efficiently computable using our current models of quantum computation, but it turns out to be extremely uh, sensitive to how you define what it means to compute something. Um, because it turns out like you're in problems where you're no longer just like, uh, just computing on classical information, but you're also computing on quantum information. Um, and you're also like sometimes considering problems where like uh, you have a thought experiment that involves basically uploading your brain to a quantum computer that like has some cryptographically encoded data. Um, my advisor has some blog posts about this that I can point you to, um, but yeah. So, so, so the answer is, um, Maybe some of the stuff in black hole physics, but other than that, I wouldn't really 
believe so. Yeah. Awesome. That was a great answer and a wonderful presentation. So are there any final questions or should we wrap up? I think we can wrap up. I, I only had like a, a summary slide anyway, so I think we went through everything. So. Oh, cool. Oh, William, this was yeah. an amazing lecture. Learned a bunch of interesting stuff. Uh, really appreciate your time. Sure. Yeah. yeah um, thank you so much. Yeah. And obviously, if you have any questions or, you know, if you want to ask about any of the things I pointed to, you're welcome to email me and I can send you the right references. Um, Sounds great. Well, we really appreciate your time, and uh, uh, and I will let you know when the uh, when the video is online in case you you know want to reference it. Like if you know if, if you have an undergraduate employee and they want a, an intro to quantum or something, you can just send them this video because now you've now you've got so, sure <laughs> uh, cool. cool side effect. Anyway, thank you so much, William. Have a great day. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye.